Uh, would you like to guide us in prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, continue to bless us with Easter joy, Easter hope, and uh, blessings to our families, our parishes, and our leadership, our bishops, priests, deacons, and all of our wonderful parishioners. And we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Well, let's start with Acts chapter 2. And and uh, look at one of Peter's first homilies. Yeah, it's one of my favorite uh, chapters in Acts of the Apostles. Okay, would you like to try it, Deacon? Sure, I love the Acts of the Apostles because it's like the, there's they struggled in those times, like even we struggle today. <laughs> things exactly. don't change much. Things don't change yeah. much today. It's true, but it can't be easy. That's right. Uh, There's from, always going to be Acts challenges. The apostles. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed, "You who are Jews, and indeed all of you staying in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to my words. You who are Israelites, hear these words: Jesus the Nazarene was a man commend, commended to you by God with mighty deeds, wonders, and signs, which God worked through him in your midst, as you yourself know." This man, delivered up by the set plan and foreknowledge of God, you killed using lawless men to crucify him. But God raised him up, releasing him from the throes of death, because it was impossible for him to be held by it. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me. With him at my right hand, I shall not be disturbed. Therefore, my heart has been glad and my tongue has exalted. My flesh, too will dwell in hope because you will not abandon my soul to the netherworld nor will you suffer your body one to see corruption your holy one to see corruption you have made known to me the paths of life you will fill me with joy in your presence my brothers i one can confidently say to you about the patriarch david that he died and was buried and his tomb is in our midst to this day but since he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw the spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that neither was he abandoned to the netherworld, nor did his flesh see corruption. God raised this Jesus. Of this we are all witnesses. Exalted at the right hand of God, he received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father. And poured him forth as you see and hear. Okay. There's Great something. <laughs> yeah. This is, I mean, this is Peter's first homily. So th this is really a special homily right here because, you know, you see the preaching of the apostles. So I think, in a special way, as priests and deacons, we can look at this and say, wow, we can learn something from Peter's first homily. Yep. Uh, what's, what's really amazing is Peter is saying, you know where David's tomb is? Well, guess what? Look at what David said in this psalm. You know, he will not suffer his holy one to see, see corruption. And essentially, Peter's saying, you know, look at all of you pilgrims who are here for Pentecost, who've come from all over to celebrate this feast. You know where David's tomb in, is, but he's dead. Yeah. And so the words of this psalm that David prophe prophetically wrote are not fulfilled in him, but in one of his descendants, and that's Christ. So there's something beautiful about that. If you've ever been to the upper room uh, in Jerusalem, most people forget about this, but right below the upper room is the traditional location of David's tomb. And I find that startling, like, wow, David's tomb is right below the upper room, I mean, right in the place. And you can just imagine, you know, the um, Jesus's disciples coming out into the streets of Jerusalem and Pentecost and sharing the gospel with others. And the tomb of David being very close by. And Peter saying, look, it's right over there, you guys. And uh, by the way, what does Psalm 16 say about not suffering his holy one to go to, to no corruption? Uh, and, and so there's something beautiful about the, about the scene. Uh, so a few, a few things uh, to mention. Uh, for, for male Jews, there were three feast days in which they had to go to 
Jerusalem. Uh, Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, mm -hmm. Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Those three, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, and Passover is sometimes referred to as the Feast of Unleavened Bread because of the seven days of unleavened bread that followed it. And the point is this, that at Jesus' crucifixion, and then 50 days later at Pentecost, there would have been lots of people from all over the place, not just Jerusalem, but from all over the Mediterranean world in Jerusalem. And that's, that's important for us because when, when the day of Pentecost occurred and the Holy Spirit came upon the church and they finally went out and shared the gospel, they went out and they met Jews from all over the Mediterranean world who they could share the gospel with right there in Jerusalem. So that's really amazing the way that this took place. Um, and so Peter talks, he goes out and he, and he says, to, he, he's with the 11 and he, and he raises his voice and proclaims from the midst of the 11. There's, it's a beautiful image of the church united together. Peter's with the other 11 and he's proclaiming his, his, his voice, uh, you know, kind of like the apostles in unity in, united with Peter proclaiming his voice to the people of Jerusalem and to the pilgrims who have come. And so he goes on and he says, you who are Israelites, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth was a man commended to you by God with mighty deeds, wonders, and signs. Every miracle is a testimony of who Christ is. It pointed to his identity. Uh, and he goes on and he says, this man was delivered up by the set plan and foreknowledge of God. And so this is part of God's plan that this happened, which, which helps to um, lessen the effect of the words that follow. And what follows is something very powerful. He says, you killed using lawless men to crucify him. This man who was delivered up by the, by the set plan and foreknowledge knowledge of God, you killed. And so Peter is really underlining this concept of personal guilt that each one of us is personally responsible for the death of Christ. And you can just imagine those who heard Peter preach the first time, the, 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 the shock that would have occurred. You are guilty of crucifying an innocent man. Uh, and, and so he goes on and he says, he says, but God raised him up, releasing him from the throes of death because it, would, it was impossible for him to be held by it. And then he goes on and quotes David a couple different times. I saw the Lord ever before me with him at my right hand. I shall not be disturbed. And he goes and he says, because you will not abandon my soul to the netherworld, nor will you suffer your holy one to see corruption. And those are the, this is the phrase that Peter really wants to focus on. Uh, because he goes on and he says, my brothers, one can confidently say to you about the patriarch David that he died and was buried. And his tomb is in our midst to this day. It's, it's right over there. You guys probably all walked right by it. David's tomb may have been a popular place for the pilgrims to go to. And he's, so there's, there's kind of a comparison between David dead, buried, and Jesus risen from the dead. But since he was a prophet and knew God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. So these are powerful words. Essentially, Peter is saying that the fullest meaning of this psalm is not applied to David or his life, but the fullest meaning and significance of this psalm, you will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption, is applied to Christ, our Lord Jesus, who's risen from the dead. And so he goes on and he says, he says, nor did his flesh see corruption. God raised Jesus. Of this, we are all witnesses. And remember that the apostles, they were witnesses of all of Jesus' ministry from the beginning to the end, to the cross, to the encounter that they had with the resurrected Christ. And so he goes on and he says, he received the, he received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father and poured him forth as you see and hear. So, this, so, so essentially, what did they hear? They heard, they heard Jews or from Galilee who were speaking all of these languages, sharing the gospel, sharing their faith in Christ with people from all over the Mediterranean world, but able to speak 
in, in these uh, native languages of the people and share with them the gospel. So, so this very first homily of St. Peter, I, I think it's beautiful because it uses something in the city of Jerusalem. The fact that David's buried there and, it's, and the fact that David wrote Psalm 16, and it takes that and says, now let's understand how this psalm applies to Christ. Any thoughts? Is he pre he's preaching to the 11 and other people too, right? Yeah, so, so basically uh, in, in the preceding verses, uh -huh. they came forth from the upper room. They came forth. They, they went into the city of Jerusalem and ah. preached to the people in their Got own it. native tongues. So what's amazing is you have pilgrims from all over the world. I see. And they're preaching to them in their native language and native tongue on the day of Pentecost. So they're not speaking with spiritual tongues, but they're speaking, they're, they're given the gift of tongues, but to speak native Words. languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they're, they're sharing the gospel with them on the day of Pentecost. And, the, and some people are, are marveling, saying, this is amazing. And others are saying, oh, they're, they're filled with new wine. They've been drinking a little yeah. bit too much. Yeah, yeah. And so in that context, Peter gives his, his uh, first homily or sermon uh, to explain that, no, no, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. And okay. that's, that's pretty profound stuff to that. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. Can you imagine hearing this? We it, get a, we get a shorter version. You know, you can see that we only get verses uh, in verse uh -huh, 14 uh -huh. and then 22 to 23. But what, what's beautiful is during this time of uh, Easter, we begin to go through the acts of the apostles. So yes. the, acts of, the acts of the apostles, it's a very important book for the church. Because we during the Easter season, we take a journey through the Acts of the Apostles. And it would be great to encourage your people to read the Acts of the Apostles during, during the Easter season until Pentecost. And so to just pick up the Acts, start reading it. Uh, those who come to Mass every day, they're going to get most of the Acts of the Apostles just in daily Mass. Cool. Uh, so this is something that we can, we can also... Um, maybe uh, encourage people to do during this time. Uh, the church often takes, uh, you know, during the, the cycle of readings, takes a little journey through, you know, through various biblical books. And so um, we're, we're going to spend a lot of time in Acts of the Apostles over the next couple of weeks. All Father right, Tim, all right. Father, Father Tim, this is Deacon Henry. On the, Just, uh, I've been to the, that tomb of David, or at least uh, the little chapel they have for him there. Um, I think it's pretty close to where the Jesus's tomb was also, if I'm not mistaken. It's pretty so, close to proximity. Yeah, so the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is in a, in a little bit different part of the city. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but the, the tomb of David, it's under the traditional location of the upper room, the cenacle. Right, yes. So when you go down from the upper room, you you go into this little you, room. You see the tomb of David right yeah. below it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so it's, it's very ironic because you have upper room above Jewish synagogue below with the tomb of David. Mm. Um, so. It's, it's, it's near the church of Dormition. That's uh, right. That's the one. Yeah. Of. yeah. Yes. It's, it's the, it's, it's, it's a little walk from the church of the Holy Sepulchre. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, they're, they're, they're definitely not that close, but um, yeah. Well, that's All it. right. Okay. Okay. Well, let's go to Psalm 16. Deacon Henry, would you like to read Psalm 16? Sure. <clears throat> the Lord will show us the path of light. Keep me, O God, for in you I will take refuge. I say to the Lord, my Lord, are you, O Lord, my allotted portion in my cup. You, it is who hold fast my lot. Hmm. Lord, you will show us the path of light. Bless the Lord who con con counsels me. Even in the night my heart exhorts me. I set the Lord ever before me, with him at my right hand. I shall not be disturbed. Lord, you will show us the path of life. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body, too, abides in confidence because you will not abandon my soul to the netherworld, nor will you suffer your faithful one to undergo corruption. 
Lord, you will suffer us. Show us the path of life. You will show me the path of life to abounding joy in your presence, the delight at your, at your right hand forever. Lord, you will show us your path of life. Wow. Yes. So, you know, what's interesting is Related most, to Jesus. Yeah. So most people, they, they don't really think of Psalm 16 as one of their favorite Psalms. <laughs> Uh, and and I think it's it's really amazing that of all the Psalms in the Psalter, Peter goes right to Psalm 16, uh, and and his purpose is very simple. It's his purpose is look at what this Psalm is saying, and see that this did not happen to David. Uh, so it must apply to someone else, not David. And he explains that it applies to Christ. Um, but the Psalm is is it's all about taking refuge in the Lord and how. Yeah. The, the Lord will uh, protect the one who takes refuge in him. Um, and, you know, my, you know, I will not be disturbed because I take refuge in the Lord. Uh, therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body too abides in confidence. And so there's something about the soul and the body. We're, we're going to be saved soul and body. That's what the, that's what's so important about the resurrection. And so, again, he says, you will not abandon my soul to the netherworld, nor will you suffer your faithful one, his body, to undergo corruption. Uh, and, and that's what's beautiful about the resurrection is we will have a resurrected and glorified body. It's more than just, it's more than just a resuscitation. And, and, we, and we, we have to explain this to people. It's more than just a resuscitation. We will be risen in glory with a body that will never ever be able to suffer death and corruption and and that's essential to talking about the resurrection we don't know what it will be like paul says to the corinthians i has not seen nor has ear heard nor has it even entered into the heart of man the things that god has prepared for those who love him so we we only know that in some way we will be like christ uh you know as christ is glorified he will he will return and those, those uh, he, Jesus explains in John chapter 5, that all will rise, the just to eternal life, the unjust to eternal punishment. Uh, and so when Christ returns, that's when we will, the resurrection will occur. Uh, and we wait for that day with longing. That's why in the early church, they would say, come Lord Jesus, Maranatha, you know, or Maranatha, as, as you hear it sometimes which, you know, come Lord, you know, it's this expectation of waiting for Christ to return so that we can celebrate the resurrection so that, that our eternal soul will be joined to our glorified body for all of eternity. Um, and so Psalm 16, is very profound because uh, it continues, uh, it continues uh, at the very end, talking about abounding joy in God's presence, the, the delight at his right hand forever. Um, and so th this is also something very important to think about that we'll be saved body and soul. Our eternal soul will be joined to our glorified body. But the greatest delight of heaven is simply to be in the presence of the Lord, to be in his presence forever, mm -hmm. for all of eternity. And, and, and this, is, this is something that will um, compel us to make every change in our life. Uh, um, if we really consider what does it mean to be in the presence of the Lord uh, and what will it mean for all of eternity, I would, I would want to make every change in my life so that everything I do, I can, I can do faithfully in God's presence while I'm here on this earth, preparing for the day when I will meet Christ face to face again. Uh, any other thoughts on Psalm 16? It's a really profound psalm. You know what I feel when, when I hear it? My feeling is I'm safe, safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this concept of my, the Lord, you are my allotted cup. Yeah. You, you know, you, you know, it is you who hold fast my lot. It's kind of like saying God is my inheritance. Um, uh, if you remember, yeah, if you remember the Levites, the Levites did not receive any land. Uh, so, you know, the, all the tribes received land. The tribe of Joseph was divided into two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. And so they, they received land, but the Levites received no land because they were told the Lord is your inheritance. So they were given cities and 
so forth, but they didn't receive an actual territory because God himself is their inheritance. Uh, and so this, Im this image of, you know, the Lord is my cup, he's my lot, he's my inheritance. And, uh, you know, it's God alone who is my inheritance. Okay, very good. All right, well, let's move on to First Peter. Uh, so Deacon Henry, uh, would you like to uh, read First Peter? Sure. Beloved, if you invoke as father him who judges impartially according to each one's work, conduct yourself with reverence during the time of your sojourning, realizing that you were ransomed from your feudal conduct, handed on by your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a spotless, unblemished lamb. He is known before the foundation of the world, but re revealed in the final time for you, who through him believed in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Okay. I, you know, I love this image at the very beginning. You know, you invoke as father him who judges impartially. Uh, and it's this image of certainly God is our judge, but he's a merciful father as well. And, and so like there's a, there's a beautiful confidence we can have on the day of judgment, knowing that the very judge that we will encounter is the one that we call father. So that's, that's, that, nothing could be more comforting than that. And then, and then also, you know, if you look at what he's saying, he says, you invoke, you invoke his father, him who judges impartially. So the concept of God being impartial is important because as his children, that means I can't get away with murder. That means mm -hmm. I have to honestly live the faith, right? So God yes. is my, God is father. He's, he's the one who, who will judge us, but he's impartial. So I have to be serious about the faith that I'm living. Uh, I can't slack off as a disobedient son. So he's going to impartially judge every single person according to their works. Uh, and that phrase, it's repeated a few different times. We're not saved by our works or the works of the law. Obviously, we have to cooperate with God's grace. Salvation is a complete gift of God's grace, but there is a work of cooperation. And, and the concept of being of each one receiving according to their works, it's important because because the Lord wants us to have a living faith, not a dead faith, but a faith that is alive. Um, and if it is, it will be fruitful. So he says to conduct yourselves with reverence during the, the period of your sondering. And, and the image is that we're just, we're on a journey in this world. This is not our true homeland. Our true homeland is the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, and each one of us is a citizen in the city of the heavenly Jerusalem. And so we're sondering, we're, we're sondering, we're going through this, this, you know, this land here, this world here, which is not our true homeland, and, but we are citizens in the heavenly Jerusalem. And so because of that, Peter says, conduct yourselves with reverence. It could even be translated with fear in the sense of a godly fear, a great re respect and reverence for everything that is holy. Um, and then realizing that you were ransomed from your feudal conduct. You know, in order to be ransomed, a price has to be paid or a life has to be given. So in the book of Ruth, you have the story of the kinsman redeemer. You may remember that story in the book of Ruth where Boaz was the kinsman redeemer uh, and he gave his life to, to, to a marriage, to be married with Ruth. And their first son was considered to be the son of the husband that died whom Ruth had, the relative of Boaz, uh, that's the kinsman redeemer. Other forms of ransom were through, you know, a price was paid. And so Jesus has given his life and he's paid the greatest price, not with silver or gold, but with his precious blood. And so this is really important, this concept of being ransomed uh, or redeemed, very important because Peter's trying to say, look at the price that's been paid for that's for your salvation, which is greater than silver or gold. It's with the very precious blood of Christ, of a spotless, unblemished lamb. He's the true Passover lamb, the new and eternal covenant. Um, and so it goes on and it says, he was known before the foundation of the world, but revealed in the final time for you. So 
even before the world was created, he, he was known by the Father, but he's been revealed to us in this final time, um, who through him believe in God, believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that our faith and hope are in God. Uh, any thoughts on on First uh, Peter? There's a lot here. Uh, I tell you, the two small letters that Peter writes are so profound. Um, I'm amazed at how, many, how much scholarship has been done on these letters, the commentaries that have come out. Uh, if you go to the Anchor Bible and you look at First Peter, for instance, the commentary is a massive commentary uh, that, because there's just so much that Peter's touching on. You touched upon it briefly, Father, but, uh, you know, sometimes we Christians, <laughs> including non-Catholics, we struggle with that whole thing of judgment, you know, about the way we live our lives and the big judges, right. but we're the ones that choose that life. The responsibility, you, what did you say? We're in partnership with him. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we choose damnation, if we choose salvation, we're the ones that put ourselves in that situation so we can judge him personally. Yeah, not us. Yeah. Him. Yeah. So, 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 you know, I mean, if Peter is using these, these terms would seem contrasting father, judge. I, you know, you're, invoking oh, I, as, see. I see. You're, in, you're invoking as father him who judges impartially. And it's like saying, you know, have confidence. He's your father, but also, also, be, you know, he is your father, but he's also, he's judging impartially. So be serious about your faith. You, you know, said because. You said cooperate. That's really good image. Yeah. So we, 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 yeah. Exactly. We cooperate with God's grace. We must respond to his grace. Um, and and uh, we must respond to, you know, to the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, you know, to the, to how the spirit is present in our lives. And so, so, you know, it's, it's one thing to call God father, but are we seeking to live as children of the living God? Mm. Or are we just are we using it as a privilege? So some people use their, uh, their, their they, some people use their family and their influence of you know family influence as a privilege. My dad's yeah. rich, my dad's yeah. rich, and look at what I got and so forth. But you know, um, Peter's saying you know he's impartial, so we we can call him father. We should have great confidence that we call him father. But he's also impartial, and knowing that he's impartial, we have to be honest. Uh, and, and really, truly, sincerely live the faith out, rather than just relying on our privileges. Oh, you know, God is my father, so everything's going to be okay. I don't have to do anything. Not with perishable things like silver or gold. <laughs> that, what a beautiful phrase. Yeah. But with the precious blood of Christ. Right. So, so it, it, really, it really reminds you, you know, that... Um, the Israelites would start their day of sacrifice by offering an unblemished lamb at 9 uh -huh. a.m. Uh -huh. And then they would offer sacrifices throughout the day. And then they would finish by offering a second unblemished lamb known as the Tamid at 3 p.m. Uh, and so here's Peter saying, look, look, it wasn't with silver or gold. It was with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a spotless wow. unblemished lamb. He is the one who fulfills, who brings to fulfillment all the offerings in the sacrificial system, which anticipated the coming of the Messiah and his one true offering, which would be offered once and for all for our salvation. Uh, it is Christ who is the spotless, unblemished lamb who has shed his precious blood uh, for our salvation. I, and I love that phrase, precious blood, uh, yeah. because it, it just helps us to really consider how um, unique and special the work of Christ is, uh, that th this is the most precious thing that the Lord could do for us, that the Father sent his own son to suffer and die for our salvation. All right. Well, let's go now to uh, the... Um, the gospel acclamation and then the gospel. So Deacon Frank, would you like to read both of them? Sure. Lord Jesus, open the scriptures to us. Make our hearts burn while you speak to us. This is from Luke, huh? That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. 
And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped looking downcast. One of them named Cleopas said to him in reply, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, what sort of things? They said to him, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. How our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now that the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? The beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us? while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us. So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the 11 and those with them who were saying, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted that what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Okay. Very good. Wow. Amazing, amazing gospel. Great stuff. And you know, you know, there, there's so much here on the road to Emmaus. You know, first and foremost, it's the day of the resurrection. It's the first day of the week. And the two disciples are walking away from Jerusalem. And direction is always important in Luke's gospel. Um, and so in Luke 9:51, for example, Jesus turns his face towards Jerusalem and he begins the journey towards the cross. And here they are on the day of the resurrection, and they're walking away from Jerusalem. So there's a, there's a sense of defeat uh, and just simply not understanding all that's taken place. And so they're, they're on a seven-mile journey to a little village called uh, Emmaus. I'll show you, um, while I have an opportunity, I'll show you a little picture uh, that I have. Let's take a look here. Okay. Um, and... Let's see if we can, okay, let's see if you, if this is uh, visible here, but yes, yeah, so if you look at this, I'm, Emmaus would be right down here at the bottom of the hill, mm -hmm. and, and Jerusalem would be right back here, that's, that's, oh, wow, that's a long distance, yeah, seven miles, it's seven miles, uh, and wow. then the, the, the hill that, the hill that, uh, that it's taken from uh, is the, um, traditional location of where the Ark of the Covenant was before David brought it to Jerusalem. Uh, and so, yeah, it's called Kiryat Yearim. It's, it's the traditional location where the Ark was before David brought it into Jerusalem in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 14 to 20. Um, and so Emmaus is, is down here at the bottom, uh, about seven miles away, and you can see they're right yeah. in the back yeah, that's that's yeah. new. That's the new Jerusalem, the new uh, modern city of Jerusalem. And right uh -huh. behind it is the old Jerusalem, the old, the older city of Jerusalem. And so 
you can just imagine they're walking away from Jerusalem to Emmaus down here, and Jesus begins to speak with them. Um, That's a day's a, walk. Huh? That's a day's walk. Well, I mean, seven, seven miles, I think you could do it in a couple hours, you know? Yeah. That's, that's two laps around Mile Square Park. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that in two and a half hours. Yeah. Dep de yeah, depending on the uh, terrain. Uh, so they're, they're walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they are conversing about all the things that have, have occurred. And what happened uh, while they were conversing and, de and debating, I love it. Jesus just kind of... Yeah comes and starts walking with them in the midst of this conversation mm. and it really really says much about you know often you know we often have to kind of you know ponder over and talk about the things that god has done in our own lives and also in salvation history to really try to understand them and here's jesus drawing up next to them and beginning to speak with them uh, and, and what's so beautiful is just the way that he he allows them to kind of work through this a little bit. You know, well, tell me about this. Um, what are you discussing as you walk along? Uh, and it, you can see, like, they stopped. You know, they, they look looking downcast. They're very downcast. Um, and and so Cleopas says uh, to him in reply, you know, are, are you only, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know these things? You know, and it's like we've got you know, hundreds and thousands of pilgrims here, and they all saw that crucifixion. The Romans were, you know, they made no bones about it. They wanted people to see the crucifixion. It was very public, and it was purposely done in a public way. Uh, and then they go on, and they talk about, you know, what happened to Jesus the Nazarene. He was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and the people, how he was crucified by their own rulers, who handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. And we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of, and, and so the sense, the sense is like, you know, we had put all our hope on this person and now we're disappointed. So it's, it's, it's this yeah. great sense of disappointment. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's, and it's important to just stop and look at the disappointment here to understand the resurrection, to understand, you know, what Jesus is talking about when he talks about scripture being fulfilled. Uh, and then they go on and talk about the women, some women in our group. It's very ironic that women were the first witnesses, Mary Magdalene and other women, because in the ancient world, women were not considered to be good witnesses. And the gospels have the women as the witness, first witnesses. So it's, it's like the opposite of what the common culture would have demanded. Uh, and centuries later, we look back and we say, wow, this is really amazing because if somebody was trying to forge this, they would never write it this way. They would never do it this way. Uh, and so it really speaks about the authenticity of the gospels uh, when, you, it, when you look at that characteristic as well. But they say that they did not find his body. They came back and report, reported that they'd seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. You know, at this point, you're wondering, what are you walking away for? You know, what, you're going the wrong direction. You know, and, and, and then some of, those, uh, some of us went to the tomb and we found it just as the women had described, but him did, they did not see. And look at what Jesus says to them. Oh, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. And that what's so important here is that Jesus is getting at, you know, believing scripture, understanding what the scriptures talked about. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. And this is really important. Why doesn't Luke give us a detailed four-page conversation with Jesus going back and talking about Isaac and Abraham and saying, that's preparing for me. And Joseph rejected by his brothers, and then his brothers coming to him asking for mercy, and, and, uh, and Jesus saying, that was referring to me. Why doesn't Luke give us four extra chapters explaining all these verses, or maybe 10 chapters? Good question. 
<laughs> and and the the reason is very simple. It that's the job of the church for every generation. Oh. And and so so Luke Luke just like he doesn't give us even one little thing to grab onto because he's like saying, look, this is this is the this is what the church will do for every generation. That's it our will, job. It's our job. It, we will continually talk about how Christ came and fulfilled all things. Uh, and so this is the job of the church to teach the faith and to help all the faithful to understand how all these things have been fulfilled in Christ. Uh, and so uh, in Acts uh, of the Apostles, you might remember the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Remember that story yeah. where he, you know, he's on his, um, yeah, his chariot and he's reading from Isaiah chapter 53. And Philip, Philip runs alongside him and says, do you know what you're reading? And he says, how am I going to know that unless somebody explains it to me, interprets it for me? You know, once again, you know, so, so Luke is showing us something really important about the church. And, um, you know, really, this is something that should give us a great um, desire to constantly read the scriptures, to study the faith, to learn the faith. Uh, and so, you know, you can really t take the opportunity if you preach the gospel to say, you know, how, you know, why don't you start a practice of reading scripture every day, one or two chapters every day, or you know, if you need any help, go to um, Mike Schmitz, Father Mike Schmitz, the Bible yeah. in a year. Good stuff. Bible, yeah, and, and go through the whole Bible in a year and then go through the whole catechism in a year. Um, and so I, I always tell people to build up their Catholic library. And I always joke around and say, your own personal Catholic library should be bigger than your big screen TV. So just take a look at that big screen <laughs> uh, TV. Next time, you walk, <laughs> next, time you walk into, next time you walk into your house, take a look at that big screen TV and ask yourself, is your Catholic library bigger than that? Uh, but but the bottom line is is that we have to make an effort. So so we we don't we have to make more than just a resolution, but a real effort to really learn the faith. Um, it, one of the best things that we can do is just going to daily mass, getting a Roman Missal, going to daily mass, and reading reading the readings every single day. Um, all these things will help us to see how how Christ has fulfilled all that was written before him. And the most important thing is that Jesus came to suffer. This is the hardest question right here. For, for first century Judaism and for Judaism every century, that the Messiah had to suffer and die. That's the most difficult question right there. Mm. Um, and, and so... You know, we have beautiful scriptures that that refer to this, like Psalm 22, where, um, you know, we hear Jesus saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remember that Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, you know, my they have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. That's Psalm 22. Uh, or we have Isaiah 53. Uh, which talks about one who by whose stripes we have been healed like a lamb before the slaughter he opened not his mouth and he gave his life for our uh, salvation through him we are justified we're forgiven of our sins uh, so there's many scripture verses in the old testament that that one could come up with but the concept of a christ who would suffer that's the hardest question right there um and so, and so, you know, we, we continually have to see how um, from eternity, the father planned to send his son to us and, and that, that his plan was that his son would literally suffer and die for our salvation. Uh, it's amazing to consider. And so beginning, beginning with Moses, Moses is, Moses in this case would refer to the first five books of the Old Testament. This would be the Torah or the Pentateuch, Moses, and then the prophets. He interpreted them what referred to him in all the scriptures. So Jesus, while they're walking to Emmaus, he talks with them about the scriptures. And, and so they urged him, beautiful words here, stay with us. They want to be in the presence of Christ. And this is their desire. This should be our desire to always want to walk with Christ, to always want to be in his presence. Uh, and so he stays with them. And when he's at table, what does he do? Uh, four verbs. He took, blessed, 
broke and gave. Now, is, and now this is really amazing. Do you see those four verbs to take, bless, break, and give? Now, I'll show you something really uh, amazing about that. Uh, let's see if we can find it here. Give me one second. Okay. We still have so, Emmaus on our screen. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, very good. So let me. Okay. Let me, let me get to Emmaus here. So you still have Emmaus here, right? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. That's all right. So I want to show you a little chart here. So if you look at this little chart here. Um, cool. Look at he, that. Yeah. So what, if you look at this, you find these four verbs. You find it three times in Mark's gospel. Uh, okay. Okay. When he multiplied bread, he took, bless, broke, and gave. Then a second time he multiplied bread, he took, gave thanks, broke, and gave. And then at the Last Supper, you find take, bless, yep. break, give. Now, you, you notice a little connection here. It's, it's like the multiplication of the loaves is preparing for the celebration of the Eucharist. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so then when you go to Matthew's gospel, you notice the same thing three times, take, bless, break, give, then take, give, thanks, break, give, and take, wow. bless, break, give. Now you notice that again, there's two multiplications in Mark and in Matthew. Well, Luke only has one multiplication, take, bless, break, give, same <laughs> verbs. Then at the last supper, take, give, thanks, break, give, and then the third one is at Emmaus. Isn't yes. that amazing? Yes. So, there's, so what I'm trying to say here, very simple, is there's, this is really amazing because the, this verbal chain of taking, blessing, breaking, giving, or taking, giving, thanks, breaking, giving, it looks back to those multiplication miracles. It anticipates the Last Supper, prepares for the Last Supper, the miracle of the Eucharist. And then at Emmaus, the breaking of the bread, scholars will say that this is a technical uh, technical way of talking about the celebration of the Eucharist, okay? And so here's Jesus taking, blessing, breaking, giving, okay? So it's not, it's not something that just kind of happens out of nowhere. That's, that's kind of the point that, that I want to make here. Um, and so at that moment that he takes, bless, and breaks, gives, what happens? <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, their eyes are open. It's, yeah. it, and so it's, it's like, wow, we have to see Jesus who's present in the Eucharist. Do you really recognize that Christ is present in the Eucharist? And I think there's a lot we can say here about the real presence of Jesus um, and really recognizing the presence of Christ in the Eucharist when we come to Mass. So at that moment, their eyes are open and they recognize him. And, but what happens right at that moment? What does he do when their eyes are open? disappears <laughs> he disappears and and this is this is the this is the amazing thing like why why did he have to disappear at the moment that they recognize him in the breaking of the bread you know what do you what do you think the reason would be for that because you know, it's because, now it's now our job to to be christ for the world yeah because well it's 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 tied to that it's it's that jesus is present now he's present with us in the sacrament he's present with us in the eucharist and now we can go out into the world and share the the gospel and 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 even the love of christ with others and so yeah the 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 the, the act of him vanishing i think is a very important question you know why right. did jesus vanish at that moment and how does that impact the way that I recognize the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, the way that my heart burns when I hear the scriptures, and the way that I go out and share the love of Christ with others? Uh, and so look what they said to each other. You know, we're not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us. And there's really, there's really something important here because um, we, we live in... in um, in a postmodern society that doesn't like to teach, it doesn't like to teach, it doesn't like to, I, I think there's, a, there's a, a lack of effort to really explain the scriptures. Um, and so this is something that we have to really consider, you know, how can we help people to really understand and know scripture? Um, and I think a lot of it is encouraging people to, to uh, really make the sacrifice. To, to recognize that this is more important than many other things that I do. Uh, sports, going to the beach, going shopping, this is much more important. 
And so this needs to become a part of my life. It needs to become a necessary part of my life, reading scripture, meditating on scripture, Lexio Divina, um, and, and, or, or just simply reading, reading the scriptures with your family, one or two chapters every night. Um, so uh, they, and at that moment, right when they recognized Christ, remember they were going the wrong way. They were going yeah. away from, from Jerusalem. Yeah. So what happens at that moment? They went back. <laughs> now they're going back. Now they're going back to Jerusalem. So remember what I said, direction is always important in Luke's gospel. Mm -hmm. The moment they, they encounter Christ, they want to go back. And, they, and, and the reason why they're going back, that's where the church is right there. They're going, it, they're drawn to go back and be with the church. And that's, that's uh, it's, it's more than just being in Jerusalem. It's being with the church. And this is what we should be drawn to. When, if we encounter Christ, we will be drawn to be with the church. We'll want to be with the church and around the church uh, and participate in the church. And so, and so they went back to J Jerusalem and they found gathered there the 11 and those, uh, uh, those with them who were saying, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. And the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them the in the, the breaking bread. of the bread. Yeah, so the last thing I want to I want to end with is just think every, every single mass should be like the journey to Emmaus because you have the first part of the mass where you have the liturgy of the word. Mm -hmm. And in the liturgy of the word, there should be a real encounter with the person of Christ. And in the second part of the Mass, you have the liturgy of the Eucharist, mm -hmm. where there should be a real encounter with the person of Christ. And so, you know, this encounter, like, they, like they, they came to really know who Jesus was. They didn't just see something, but they came to know the person of Christ. And that's, that's what should happen to us every time we go to Mass, and we have that real encounter with the Word of God and with Jesus, who's tr truly present in the Holy Eucharist that we should come to really know who Jesus is, to know him, to understand him, and to serve him. So I just open it up to your thoughts. What do you guys think? Anything, any uh, other comments and thoughts on the, uh, this incredible scripture? A lot, of stuff. a lot There's of stuff. A lot of stuff. <laughs> There's a lot here. <laughs> yeah. There's That's so why it mass, you know, the way we design our churches, particularly as Catholics, and, and it was a challenge with uh, Christ Cathedral. The importance of like the ambo, the word, and the altar, the Eucharist, you know, and how I love this, the connection there that of both. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. you know what I see, you said it right. Jesus is a really good teacher. <laughs> you know, he yeah. asks questions, he lets them talk, he lets them work it out. And he gives us a gift. So. And then he, he's gone. Okay, you guys, it's in your hands now. So That's right. You know, for me, Father, when uh, that road to Emmaus is that it's always happened to me. Um, when you're walking away from the cross, God or Christ puts people in your pathways to turn you back towards him. That's what I, I always like about this road to Emmaus for me. And... Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, all the way through Pentecost, up to Pentecost, I think this is the, um, what's it called? Jesus' sightings. All the readings will be towards uh -huh. be that. So the other thing is, it wasn't Jesus' time to ascend yet. He needed to go see other people that truly believed in him and get the word out hmm. that he's still around. Hmm. I think like your right. emphasis. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Your emphasis. Yeah, he, he wanted to let it go. He's not abandoning them. He's just going mm -hmm. yeah. to the right. Uh, to no, he's them. he's doing the opposite of abandoning them. He's right. he's with us. He's yeah. with us, but he's he's showing us how he's gonna going right, to be with right. us. You, you talked yeah. about the Jesus and how important it is and how we, we struggle with it, mm -hmm. and some more than others, about that it's a suffering savior. Yeah. And that's why uh, I, in our Catholic tradition, the crucifix yeah. is such an integral part of who we are mm -hmm. to, to always be reminded. Mm -hmm. oh. Yes. Very good. All right. Thanks, All right. Well, you guys, I tell you, Father, Father Bruce, any other thoughts? I'm here to leave, Father.
Okay. Go to another meeting. All right. Well, thank you once again for uh, another awesome week. Um, so thank you, uh, Deacon Henry. Would you like Would you like to finish uh, with a closing prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, continue to give us the many blessings and keep us on that path uh, towards you and continue to bless us in so many ways and send the people down to guide us, help us um, to spread the good news to others, those who are truly in need. And we, in his name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Have a blessed, have yes, a blessed day. Good seeing you again, Thank Frank. You. Thank bye, you Henry. So much. Bye, bye now. Bye, Father. Bye, Father. God bless you. Bye-bye.